blame Kevin Graham. Oh, <laughs> you caught me saying that. What I was saying there is, if I'm late, it'll all be my fault, but I'll blame Kevin Graham. We want to talk about Kevin. <laughs> Here we go. This is a Celtic state of mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. It's Wednesday. And instead of having the four contributors today, it's just John Hughes and myself, the top two that I would liken to Sam and Asson Hooper. Here we go. <laughs> Loads to talk about. John Hughes. It's We're at that point where there's a little break in proceedings. Um, it gives you an opportunity, I think, to take stock of where we are, what we've <laughs> kind of been through, and how we're going to get over the line here. You know, it's, the, it's like the last lap, really. Um, we've got some really important players coming back. We've got a wee bit happening in the background, of course. So where are we in your view, John, in terms of this season, still going for the double? Are you confident? Where are you? What's your state of mind? Well, I'm considerably more confident than I was. Um, the, the weekend to me was just, it was almost back to the games that you know we expect to see, which is, you know, we're we are completely solid, but you know we're just uh, trying to break down uh, a compact team uh, over ninety minutes, <clears throat> and that can be difficult to do. But it was, you know, to be fair, if we weren't as anxious, and if we hadn't just been, you know, if that wasn't only our second game, you know, in a winning streak, uh, you would be, you would just say that was completely routine. Yeah, uh, yep. and uh, you know. I can't begin to tell you how much I like that. Um, I, I, I was on Twitter and I'm looking at the group chats and stuff up to half time, and people were losing their minds about you know we weren't playing well and it wasn't going well and this is garbage and that's garbage. That's not what I saw at all. Uh, I was just thinking uh, this looks really solid, uh, and I, I was happy with how we were playing because I didn't get the impression that we weren't going to score quite the opposite, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah, to me, it just looked like, yeah, no, we're going to potentially score a bunch here. Um, and, you know, players that you wanted to play well were playing well. Um, you know, obviously, defensively, we still have that problem. I spoke about it last week. The defensive unit is an issue for me. And also, just you know, address that when... People saying he should have brought on Lagerbielk instead of dropping a water back in there, and that's why. But if you actually watch that, so Taylor gets monstered as he always does, and it drops at a water's feet. It doesn't drop at his head. Wouldn't it have made a difference if Lagerbielk was there, in my view? Uh, but anyway, you know, just in terms of if we're going into an international break, uh, a game to make you feel much more confident, much happier. That was ideal for me. Um, and there was lots to it, you know, and I'm sure we'll come to it, but lots of, you know, lots of players were, you know, stood up to the mark. And thankfully, I'm on record as saying um, Nicholas Kuhn was an absolute diamond. A ball. Um, and yeah. and, and no, no, one, no one should uh, criticise him at all. <laughs> uh, and I'd appreciate if nobody went back to check what I actually said. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that's the kind of thing you want to happen. Uh, it's so necessary, it's so important for us to have guys coming into form at the right time. Because, look, our first team, you know, picks with everyone in form are probably good enough to get this done, you know. But everyone has to step up to the mark, and that is not easy to do. Uh, and we've seen it uh, all year. Uh, and guys are some guys are playing well, other guys aren't. And we just don't have enough guys who are, you know, a class apart from the opposition, um, who, you know, can have a bad game and still, you know, influence the game. Uh, we need everyone playing well. Uh, so, look, I mean, for me, it was great. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, very happy, uh, as you can, as happy as I can be, given the state of things. There's no point in, you know, constantly moaning about the squad and, you know, all of that. We are where we are just now. So in terms of backing the team, thought it was great. Uh, so happy with that. You know, you, you mentioned something there, John, that I totally get, and that was the fact that um, it was a routine win. It was a win at home that you would expect that type of performance, that type of domination and result. But unfortunately, this season, there's been too many occasions where when we've expected that, we've not got it. And I think that was uh, one of the, the biggest points for me. I was coming away from that thinking, we should have been doing that all season, even though I know that it's been stop-start We've had to chop and change the personnel, the injury list. I don't care about anybody else's injury list. I'm only concentrating on Celtics. It's been absolutely awful this season. 
And, you know, when we list Carter Vickers back, he'll go firing all cylinders. Kuhn looks like a player all of a sudden. Rio and Callum are on their way back. Dermot Desmond's got his flamethrower to the SFA. And this is why we're up for a title fight. I couldn't fit that Dermot Desmond bit in there. I wanted to give him, I wanted to give him a wee bit of credit because, um, you know, there is a, a train of thought, a uh, school of thought, John, that um, if, you're, if you're too critical of the club, then you might be placed on what they call the naughty step. And I think that um, if you want to be as honest as possible, sometimes it might come across as being brutal. But that's what we've got to do, John. And the reason I'm bringing that up is um, I noticed Jungle Lion earlier on Twitter um, quote tweeted a story. Uh, and basically the story was ripping Celtic to shreds um, if you want to believe what the Daily Record said about Burnaby. So I thought, wait a minute. Well, why is Burnaby ripping us to shreds? The guy's not been great for us. And so I had a look. I did that thing, John, where I actually I took the bait and I clicked. <laughs> right. So thanks, Jungle Lion. There you go. Another day, another attack on Celtic by the media. Pathetic. And uh, to be honest with you, you could probably spend a, a portion of your day every day going through and finding this kind of example, John. So I've gone in and Burnaby said nothing, nothing resembling what the headline suggested. He wasn't having a dig at Celtic. He wasn't having a dig at Rodgers. He wasn't saying, I couldn't get out quick enough and all this nonsense. He basically gave you the Christmas card nonsense you normally get from a new signing. Oh, I'm really looking forward to it. When I heard of their interest, I was there. Um, obviously, via Amsterdam for Bernie because nothing simple for the guy. But in terms of the media, they're ramping it up, John. They are ramping up the narrative. It's anti-Celtic. Um, and, and we shouldn't really be su surprised at that, should we? Well, I mean, that, that's why I was uh, really appreciated um, Abada's statement when he left. Mm -hmm. Because that one in particular, it was carefully crafted to say nothing at all other than things that were complementary or neutral. Uh, obviously, a lot of thought had gone into it. Uh, and you assume a lot of thought had gone into it because Abada himself and his team knew that uh, anything... Yeah, critical at all, uh, would have been pounced on, magnified, and you know, absolutely blown up to be a huge, huge drama. Uh, I mean, we got three days of headline news from Brendan Rogers saying good girl. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, that that's that's where we are. And obviously, you know, the one of the reasons why the Celtic fan media is so popular is because we know this. We know you cannot rely uh, on uh, the, the mainstream media. Uh, I mean, if you take, for instance, uh, you know, I, I didn't even realise it dropped out, but there's Graham Spears over the, the last number of days called out the sectarian singing. Yeah. But Graham Spears was basically, he's no longer mainstream. Now, I thought, you know, he was writing for the Times and stuff. I know he wrote my dad's obituary for the Times. Um, so I thought he was still, you know, there, but he is freelance, and which is why you can't be put you can't put pressure on him. <clears throat> but there's no chance anyone calls out stuff like that because you, your editor will slaughter you because all you're going to get is negative press. People cancel on subscriptions. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm never going to read your paper again. Never darken my door. All that sort of stuff. So because he's on a, he's got his own podcast now. He's fit to do that. Um, but the you know if you're reading tabloid press, I can't I couldn't even tell you the last time I picked a tabloid up, and I deliberately deliberately try not to click on links. What I look for is if I see a tabloid link that says something, I look for a story about Celtic, which says it's a completely different headline, but it's almost certainly coming from the same place. Yeah. Um. So it's difficult to do though, because you know sometimes they they do have stories of interest, but. You know, you have to try and avoid them wherever possible. And if, whenever I share their stuff on social media, I don't share the link. I just share a picture. Uh, you know, yeah. to, to try and um, to try and discourage people from going in it. Um, but yeah, I mean, all all the usual forces are arrayed against us. Uh, that's no surprise at all. Um, and uh, you know, I I think though that I mean, honestly, if we were to win this. I think it would break them. You know, well, from the position they're in absolutely. just now, yeah. I think the meltdown would be, you know, cataclysmic. Uh, and for us, it would be euphoric 
Uh, and not to mention, absolutely hilarious. No, there would be a, a hilarity attached to it, John. Um, I remember, obviously, the, the last time, the first time they won the title, and they celebrated by battering each other in George Square during a, um, a global <laughs> lockdown. So, I, I mean, the meltdown would be sensational, John. And I mentioned it yesterday, you know, the... the uh, the breakdown of all these empires all happening in 2024. Who'd have guessed it? Who's got money on the royal family absolutely disintegrating in front of her eyes? Uh, the SFA, as I say, Dermot Desmond walking in with his flamethrower and uh, his dossier, which we'll talk yeah. about. And, uh, of course, the Rangers meltdown would be sensational. And um, not by design, it's got to say, be said, John, because it has been uh, a season fraught with, with disappointment, um, with danger of losing it. And the very fact that we're going to this international break, a couple of points ahead, virtue, of course, of having played a game more. Um, psychologically, John, I think it's a good thing. And I mean, listen, we're in a situation where um, a football club are complaining about a game getting called off for the weather and uh, the way in which that was dealt with. I think we've got a bigger argument, haven't we? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I saw a Dundee fan, someone retweeted a Dundee fan tearing up his shreds, saying, why didn't you wait? You could have postponed the kickoff. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone was there. It was offered to d delay it for an hour, or, you know, and then I think there was something about the television deal. But, I mean, as we know, the television deal was garbage anyway. Uh, so would it actually matter at all? Um, you know, at the end of the day, I was sort of delighted by that because... I think, you know, as someone pointed out, I think earlier on in the week, it needs to be played before the split, which means it's got to be jammed in between a few games, which mm -hmm. means if they get, if they, you know, it is, it is Dundee, to be fair, you know, and even at their own ground, do they really pose a threat? Um, but, you know, that said, in between a whole load of other fixtures, you could get a run of injuries, you could get people you know, uh, not playing well or, you know, deciding they're not up for it, you know, on, the, you know, on a big muddy pitch or whatever, and then mm -hmm. that attitude starts to pervade. Um, you know, millions of things could happen. That's why, you know, the, the, the wisdom is burned in the hand. That's why that's, why that's a saying, um, because it's true. A bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. And in our case, points are better than uh, uh, actually having games in, uh, still to play, so you know anything can happen in a football game. We all know that it's not, you know, it, it's it's not rugby. It's not completely usually, you know, one sided. Uh, if one team's dominant over the other, anything can happen. That's the beauty of football. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm, I think we are uh, in a stronger position because of it. Uh, now that might not turn out to be the case, and we still need to just focus on ourselves um, and. Again, I saw some of the comments there saying, you know, it sounds as if we're making excuses uh, for Rogers now. Uh, but that's, you know, not the case. Basically, lads, I'm just in a good mood today. Now, this is a very rare occasion. You know, usually I'm on here like a big curmudgeon, just grumping and moaning. So I'm in a good mood today. Take advantage. Um, so essentially, yeah, I mean, you know, Rogers has had a bit of a mare on a number of occasions and the recruitment's been abysmal all that sort of thing. But the important thing is what's happening on the pitch. Uh, <clears throat> now we have positives. Now we have things to look at, you know, where you can really get behind and think, do you know what? I, I, I said weeks ago that I was hopeful, not faithful, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because I needed I needed something to get my teeth into to actually make me believe rather than just be clutching at straws. And that performance at the weekend, you start to see the, the, the shoots of something there that does make you believe, that does make you think, oh, wait a minute, you know, because if, uh, you know, when Yang comes back and Kuhn's playing like that, we've got a couple of very, very good options there. Palmer comes back and offers more creativity on the other side. Uh, Kyogo is playing like a wee diamond again. Uh, he was running about like a Duracell bunny at the weekend, um, and uh, it was tremendous to see, really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I thought Awata looked very, very solid, um, and, you know, Bernardo is what he is. He offers all that endeavour, but very little creativity. <clears throat> Still won't pass it forward. Uh, and uh, Matt O'Reilly's just blown hot and cold. But, you know, again, 
those are things to you know look forward look forward to and think you know we can make progress there. If CCB is back, I think if CCB is doesn't you know back to full fitness or is injured in any way for the rest of the season, I think we've got massive problems. Massive problems. I think is that important because that defensive unit, as I said before, is not functioning at the moment. You know, without CCB, we've got a lot. You know, we've got guys who you know can't win aerial challenges. Um, you know, you've got Greg Taylor, who although he's been doing well going forward, has this, all the same historical issues he's had, which just proved at the weekend. AJ has not been great defensively, although he's great going forward. So, you know, defensively, I, you know, I think that's my biggest concern at the moment because it looks like we've got the creativity back. So then it comes down to. Can we just keep scoring more than the opposition? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know the thing, John, talking about the difference between having Carter Vickers in there and not, I think is is epitomised by the last two games. You're up against Livingston at home, who are, are not a good side, yet they're drawn to each of us, and, and Joe Hart has to pull off a really good save. And then we we put a wee glean um, on the scoreline by scoring another couple of goals and getting into the next round. And then you compare that to the St. Johnston game, um, whereby, you know, Cat Vickers goes off and we can see the goal. Um, but it was a dominant performance. And it started from the back. You know, the 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 lethargic nature of the Welsh scales combination, where it's passing back and forward, side to side, maybe uh, passing into the midfield area. It was just so slow and predictable. And it gives your opposition the opportunity to really uh, regroup at the back and get their shape, and Livingston did that. Any team will do that against you. You bring in Cat Vickers, and the whole dynamic changes. And I don't, I don't subscribe to the fact that it doesn't matter who he's playing alongside, but he definitely plays um, like Welsh plays better alongside Cat Vickers. Scales plays better alongside him. How good would it be though, John, to have someone? You know, why not have someone? at the same level as Carter Vickers playing alongside them. Is that what we thought we were bringing in when Novroski came in for 4.3 million quid? Um, was he the guy that we thought could partner him and be his equal? Well, I, I think that's definitely what we thought because that was similar to the amount of money we got for Starfield, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we definitely thought that was the guy. I, I, I'm not convinced he is the guy. I think the manager's not convinced he is. Same with Lager Bjork. Yeah, I mean... You know, the fact that we've persisted with the, you know, scales and Welsh just really shows you what the manager thinks um, and doesn't like them, obviously. I thought, for instance, when the uh, Navroski came on um, against Rangers when I was at that game, that first sort of five, ten minutes he played, I was just thinking, this lad's a bomb scare. He's an absolute bomb scare. And then he put in a couple of decent tackles and, and settled into the game and did pretty well. But you know, is he a four point three million pound player? Well, I suppose. You know, what does a four point three million pound player get you in today's market? You know, it's probably someone about that standard. Yeah. Which is why, yeah. which is why we are where we are, because you, you know, four point three million is us splurging. That's Christmas for us. You know, oh, but we're going over three million. You know, fantastic. Uh, so no, it was. You know, but if you if you looked at it at the, the start, you were thinking uh, is actually Big Gus. Uh, uh, is he the man that's been brought in? <laughs> because his pedigree seemed to be a bit better. Um, and then, as it turns out, none of them have. And it's a, it's a real, real interesting one for uh, the summer because what you're thinking is, how are we going to manage this? I know. Look, there's yeah. £7 million pounds worth there. And we're just what putting them straight out the door. What are we going to get back for that? You the, know, minute, the minute you start loaning them out, and obviously that was the intention in January with Lager Bielka. The minute you do that, John, it's almost as if you're giving the player away for six months, twelve months, eighteen months to run down the contract. You know, it's almost as yeah. if you've admitted this has been a complete waste of money. Barca style or Yeti. Let's loan them out and loan them out. Let them run down their contract, and eventually they'll go for free or a nominal fee. So I think that is something that's going to be really disappointing in the, in the summer, but it wouldn't surprise me, particularly with Lagerbjelk. Yeah. Well, I, you know, if you look at the potential size of the rebuild we have given, well, I mean, you were thinking the likes of Matt O'Reilly's definitely getting a move and all the rest of it. I'm not sure if that's the case now. Uh, you know, uh, based on how his performance has gone since um, 
since the break. Uh, you know, he might have been better taking advantage of the, the old Atletico Madrid uh, deal, wasn't it? So uh, I don't know, um, you know, who's going to leave in the summer, but, you know, given the way, as I say, the likes of Matt's played and Carter Vickers' injuries and all the rest of it, we might not lose guys who we thought we were going to lose. But, you know, you have to think about what we're talking about here in terms of scraping over the line against that Rangers side, absolutely scraping over the line. How far away is this team from uh, being acceptable in Europe? You know, what we are just at the moment, um, it's not even, it doesn't hardly be us thinking about it, to be honest, because they're so, if you look at, if we were to play a game in Europe now, just now, uh, against decent European opposition, that back line wouldn't last minutes, uh, I don't think. Uh, you know, it, it could be a frightening score. Uh, and I think from outside of Scotland, we are very, very far off it at the moment. And it's going to be, you know, people said, is it, would it be like an Ange-style rebuild? I think it wouldn't be far off it. You know, I, I really think it wouldn't be far off it. I think there's a serious amount of money needs to be spent. Um, and, of course, you know, what we know is how likely is that to happen? So we wouldn't build from a position of strength. Well, we build, you know, if we lose, and it looks like, you know, the, the they're certainly thinking about it because the American tour looks like it's been set up as warm-ups for potential Champions League third-round uh, qualifying games. So... You know, which is fair enough, we had good forward planning in the event that happens. If it doesn't happen, then fine. But the fact that we're contemplating that is shocking. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk myself out of my good mood. Uh, we are we are for we are. Um and we, we need to go over the line with the guys that we've got, but we are so far away from being a, a European class uh, team that we want. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not even close to the team we were at the start of the year, never mind the you know, the, the team we want to be. So, yeah, I mean, there's a, an awful lot of work to be done. We have a massive rebuild coming. But right now, I suppose it's all short-term thinking, isn't it? Yeah, um, and, but John, this is the thing that we, we always get drawn into this trap because every pre-season we're talking Europe, we're talking aspirations, going into a new campaign. That's a crack of a mug, can I just point out? Oh, yeah. What, yeah. what a mug that is. That so's the one you hold. So's the one you're holding in your hand. Look at that. The original Bumblebee. The Bumblebee. There you go. The old axle. That that, yeah. that 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 you might point out is the, the merch I got from the Axom site because it was the only thing that fitted me. Thanks very much for that, Paul John. <laughs> yeah, you hardly had this, mate. Oh, more to come. Check it out on the Axom <laughs> shop. Th these items will be available uh, at a live event near you soon as well. Lots of great comments coming in, and I'm keen to bring in as many as we possibly can. Um, because John and I have our opinions, you may disagree. But what I was saying there, John, is about us going into a season and you think to yourself, what is it you want to do? What are you aspiring to? We come off a triple winning season. Rogers is in the building and we've signed at that point nine players in the summer. And you, you want to improve, you want to develop and progress in Europe. My frustration is the club, in terms of the, you know, the statements they give when you've got your financials coming out, John, they'll look at, progression in Europe being we won more points, therefore we, we earned more money in Europe. And they might see that as progress. I don't. I think that we were we were dreadfully unlucky in a couple of the games. We did really, really well against Atletico Madrid at home. We got our win against Feyenoord, of course. Your man Lagerbelt scoring the winning goal. But over the piece, we were shown up as being um, naive in many of the, the areas. And um, had we actually looked at replacing like for like in terms of quality, we would we would have done a much better job in Europe this season. But I also think that the chopping and the changing in terms of the, the churn rate of the amount of players that we are selling on, John, doesn't help. Um, Matt O'Reilly has remained, but we expect him to move in the, in the summer. How do we replace him? Will we do it um, sufficiently? Because obviously we've seen this time round, we didn't replace Jota or Starfelt or even Moy, arguably, um, with sufficient quality. 
So that's my big concern going into the summer. But the club do reel you in because we're sitting here now, John, just talking about just getting over the line, just winning domestically. And in the summer, we don't talk like that at all, do we? No. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the tragedy and the, the depressing thing is what we've come to realise now is Ange was the exception, not the rule. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the rule is, well, our, our recruitment, I mean, I, I can't remember the last time our recruitment was good. Or, you, you know, you could say, I must, under Martin O'Neill, maybe, was the last time we were buying players, you thought, oh, that's quality, that's great, that's going to really improve the side. Um, and since Scott and Strachan, it's been nothing but, you know, a managed decline, as we know. So uh, it gets really, really tiring um, to be constantly, because we all, as fans, you're constantly getting your spirits up. Mm-hmm. You, you think this is brilliant. So we have, we can take advantage of this situation. We can crack on from here. We can build on these excellent foundations we've established. Yeah. But instead, we seem quite happy with, you know, taking a blame throw at the foundations, um, or just letting them erode, or you know, building nothing on them. Next thing you know, your foundations of sand uh, and you've lost important titles, you've lost important cups and so on. So, uh, no, it's um, we have a terrible track record uh, in this sort of arena. Um, and it's, you know, I suppose Mark Wall was supposed to be the, the you know, the, the first uh, way to address that. Yeah. But as we've, as we've established, you know, yes, right, that's the right structure, wrong people. So we haven't been able to get it right uh, so far. Uh, and I'm um, not confident we're going to get it right going forward. You wouldn't have thought it was that difficult. There'll be loads of guys in recruitment, especially under a director of football. Um, and you could put an excellent structure in place. There's nothing to stop us doing that. Um, Brendan Rodgers quite clearly doesn't want to be the guy in recruitment. You know, it's not his job, or at least he doesn't see it that way. He didn't come from a background where he was picking all the players either. So he's used to working with a big recruitment team and guys giving him options. Uh, obviously, he thought he could trust uh, the judgment of Mark Lowell, and uh, he, that is not the case. Um, so, you know, you think the clue would have been in the name. But anyway, it's simply, you know, <laughs> what, what are we, why do we constantly, you know, even when we have a good idea, make it bad. There is very simple, we've had a need for, no but no manager is going to stay at Celtic for more than two or three years. because They have either failed and they're out or they have succeeded and they're out. Absolutely. So there, there, there's no point in pretending, you know, I mean, I managed to convince myself that I might stay for a wee while uh, mainly because I liked them so much. Uh, but, you know, you're totally projecting uh, and even when it's been, made, even when it's clear at the time that you are projecting, you're still going. I think he might, he might stay. You know, different from been, all the rest, John. No, exactly. Way, you know, you believe know. the pillow talk from <laughs> Big Ange. You know what I mean? It's, a, it's <laughs> might be, it might be a dynasty. This could be us. He could be the next yep. team. He's never going to leave us. You know. So um, basically, he leaves you, and then you're like the, the divorced ga- dad. You're taking the kids. To... So. I know. It's uh, <laughs> so it's, you know when you when you see them doing south, you know, yeah. being completely embraced by a new fan base, and you just yeah. it's like you're you're outside in the rain looking in. It's like that meme, uh-huh. um, you know, you're just looking in there, and, and there's Ange enjoying it, and everybody's buying into him, and you think yeah, just yeah. wait till Liverpool come. That's calling. exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's, he's he's going to tell you he loves you, and then he's going to leave. It's, yep. uh, it's like the divorce party. Uh, so no, it's uh, you know for all it's funny, uh, that is the case that that was very much the exception. And even in Ange's tenure, I think we've established what is that a window or a window and a half. Um, he, he did phenomenally well, basically from his own contacts. Um, and you know, thankfully for us, and I'll always be grateful for that. I said at the time, I don't think anyone else except Ange um, could have done it, and I stand by that. Uh, I don't think Rogers could have come in and done that rebuild. I don't think. Eddie Howe could have come in and done that rebuild. Uh, I think uh, we fell backwards very fortunately uh, into Ange's appointment. And, I, you know, 
uh, I will always be grateful for that because it was so important for rebuilding the team. The core of that team is what's keeping us afloat right now. You know, now that is outrageous, but that's a fact. You're right. So it's the core of that team that, that's keeping us together. And um, no, it shouldn't be. It absolutely shouldn't be. But you know, is that core going to be enough to get us over the line? Uh, I am still hopeful and starting to get a good bit more faithful. Yeah, you're right. It's the same with any any kind of um, reshaping of a of a football side uh, or or even a business. I mean, purchasing has to be done properly. The buys have to um, have a good hit rate, John. And we've simply not had that for four transfer windows. So you look at the team now that started at the weekend. You think, right? Well, Alistair Johnston was purchased during the Mark Lowell era, um, and then you look at the summer uh, incomings, and you think, well, Bernardo he came in in the summer. What about the rest of them? And as you say, the core group there came in during that that flourish, if you like, uh, under Ange Postecoglou, where we were using recruitment, albeit you know we a lot of the same people in the scouting team, etc. We were using it differently, and there was a conversation with uh, Kevin Graham earlier on this week <clears throat> where we were talking about the criteria that the recruitment team is working from. So Matt Lowell, you know, he's been given a list of age criteria this is a player we don't want him to be over this age this wage this transfer fee etc 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 and okay that's fine every team will have that every every team will have these parameters unless you're mega mega rich and you'll buy anything that, that comes your way regardless of the price so that's fine and i think that it's it's necessary to have it but with the caveat john that if something presents itself and it's such a good opportunity then you should be able to break the wage structure or the transfer structure to get that player in. And we, we can't be that rigid all the time, can we? Well, I, you know, again, we, we have discussed this before and I made this point. If those criteria were set by the board or um, uh, Michael Nicholson, you know, I, I did ask how far up does that go? And if it goes to Nicholson, then it should be Nicholson's head that rolls. But so when you think about it, is that how Mark Lowell and, and he started sold them to the club? He said, look, this boy has all this experience, he's all these contacts. We think we can turn this into a money-making machine uh, because we've got this database. We're going to get all these kids in at this age. We're going to punt them on for absolute fortunes. Uh, it'll all be uh, bonuses and increased salaries um, and uh, happy days and hopefully you know, we may get a couple of decent players as well. Uh, so I'm starting to think that might have been the case because I would think Michael Nicholson would have been bang in trouble, you know, trying to explain to Dermot Desmond why Mark Lowell's got to go if those were the criteria set and Mark Lowell wasn't able to go beyond them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm starting to think really it was Mark Lowell's criteria uh, and he very stupidly uh, stuck to them because he didn't fully understand what he was doing, it wasn't really the job that he'd ever done before. Um, so, you know, he, he, he was never a guy spotting players, he was never a guy who knew what a talented player was. So he was looking at data. Uh, and, we, you know, we've got, you know, the likes of Alan Morrison and Jugo James and the huddle board and those boys. I mean, they, they, they do a lot, tons of data analysis. But, you know, that can be helpful. It can be very, very helpful. But it doesn't, it's not the be all and end all. So, you know, if you're looking, you know, and then, of course, when he did break the criteria, uh, his own criteria, um, he broke it to a, well, he didn't break the criteria, but when he did go outside of the normal ways of searching for people, he did it for Lagerbiel and then it seemed to ignore the stats completely because it was Starfelt's agent and all that got punted through on, on, on a handshake. Uh, and we ended up with a guy who the manager decided within minutes of watching him just wasn't fast enough um, and has I feel sorry for Lager Bill to be honest yeah. here, because you know he's come in and he would have thought that he had been scouted and he was there to do a job and he would have thought that he was coming in with the blessing of everyone who had you know comprehensively watched him play and made those decisions but that was not the case and, and the, the boy has been treated Quite poorly, and that's nobody's fault except the likes of Mark Lobel. Uh, but I mean, I Brendan's got to hold his hands up for that as well. Uh, I said that before, there's plenty of blame to go around, 
uh, using Andrew's homework and saying, oh, these guys are already in the pipeline. No, you were in. You had plenty of time, plenty of time to look at them, plenty of time to assess them. And, and all that time, nobody worked out the fact that based on his stats, it was very, very clear that Lager Bielt was not fast uh, and would not play well in a high line of defence. And we've discussed it to death. But for me, the implications of it were so, you know, I, I felt those implications at the time were really serious because mm-hmm. it meant that Rogers even bothered to check and that Lowell didn't have a clue what he was doing. So, you know, I, and that's turned out to be the case. Uh, so, you know, Brendan's not having uh, his best season here, let's be honest, uh, whether it's making substitutes or, you know, uh, what he's done with the recruitment. But hopefully what this season has done for him has made him realise how big this task is. Yeah. That he is the man with whom the buck stops. And that he, because this is the thing, I don't think it occurred to him that he could lose a title here and just essentially ruin his reputation. Coming on from treble winners, he thought he was going to, I think he thought he was going to walk in and he was going to stroll it. Uh, and that, that has not been the case. And I think uh, maybe now he's starting to get an idea of how big this job is. Because ultimately, Brendan will always be uh, you know, primarily about Brendan. So if he loses up here in a two-horse race, with 70 million in the bank, you know, how do you think that's going to look to clubs around Europe and clubs in England and all that? I mean, that's his reputation ruined. You're right, because at that point, <clears throat> you're looking at um, the profile of an ex-premiership manager trying to get a job in Saudi or something along those lines, John. And he'll be well aware of that. And I think that um, just trusting the presentation that he was given. Um, but again, you'll remember that Callum McGregor, there was a meeting and McGregor was saying, listen, we do this differently now when it comes to recruitment. Um, so I, I, he's got my sympathies in that respect. But he rubber stamped on his words. He's okayed every single move. So if he's bringing a player in um, and that does not fit your style, then you've got to take responsibility or a portion of that. The, the issue I've got with these criteria, John, is that when you think of um, a worldwide global recruitment um, strategy, for example, and the, the means of identifying players having to be, in this day and age, having to be data-driven. right? So that only identifies someone who's on a shortlist. You don't go and buy them based on that. You then scout them. You then go and give them the eye test. You then you know pass it on to the manager. He might look at the three or four players on a short list and decide, like Ange did, I'm going to speak to them. So Ange then started contacting these guys, and he contacted Joe Hart, who had been in discussions with Celtic a year before when they signed Barkas. Um, but, you know, Ange felt that he had a hunger and a passion to succeed at Celtic, and then the deal was done. Ange phoned Paddy Roberts. Paddy Roberts was still on a spreadsheet somewhere, John, and he didn't think that Paddy Roberts had the same kind of passion and uh, determination to make it happen at Celtic. So I'm guessing at that point we have gone and either signed Neda or Abada, someone along those lines. It was in season one under Ange. I just felt that maybe the recruitment team got a, a, a window of opportunity in between managers where they've had kind of free range on and they brought in a group of guys who were either not good enough or not ready for the, for the side. And what you've seen now is... Um, Quan, Tilio, and almost Lagerbilt being loaned out six months after we signed them. Um, and there's a couple of guys in there in the mix that, that Rogers is getting a tune out of. So he's getting a tune out of Yang. Let's not forget he has got a tune out of Palmer. Um, but again, were they ready to step right into the stand 11? Probably not. So yeah. it's been a disaster um, in that respect. The fact he's away, though, John, the fact that Lowell's away. I, again, think it's a, an opportunity for Celtic to put it right. But it's not just getting another figure into a position. The whole strategy, the whole setup has to be right before you get the bodies in. Yeah, and we're, we're an awful long way from that. Um, and that has been the case uh, for a long time. As I said before, you know, I, I don't believe, yes, the manager has to have a say. Yes, the manager, you know, really has to have uh, final sign off, but that saying that final sign off should be on the back of the director of football who is uh, looking at the style of play mm-hmm. uh, and a recruitment team, but also 
looking at style of play. So you're not buying just good players. You're buying good players who play your style, yeah. uh, who, who can fit into that. Now, the other thing is as well, with the advent of all this technology, there is so much competition for the, you know, and the, the, the even the market that we are shopping in for the, you know, below 23 and other, you know, we're not the first people to think about this. You know, there's trading clubs all around the world. And the difference is the guys with a big money are buying these boys at 18. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're, they're forking out, you know, 20, 30, 40 million for an 18-year-old who might never kick a ball for the first team. You know, uh, and then, you know, you go down that level with all that money and then you come to us. Uh, and therefore, if you're going to stick to those criteria and you're not looking for the occasional diamond in the rough, like a Carter Vickers or a Jota, uh, uh, you don't have guys with enough experience in the team to say, look, that boy's a player, he's just had a hard time there and all the rest of it. If it's purely about getting the kids in that are earning 15 grand, you know, that is not functional. Uh, and it's just ludicrous. You know, you're, you're hamstringing yourself. You know, before, before you've even started, you've hamstrung yourself. You know, but you need to have, in order, to, in order for that uh, to work, you need to have the structure in place with the right people. And the thing about, you know, rec you know, people working in recruitment, if it's not working out, you let them go. Mm -hmm. You know, you let them go quickly. And it's nowhere near as dramatic as having to let go a manager, you know, uh, even a director of football. So the guys in recruitment can, you know, uh, there's a lot of times, that certainly the ones at Celtic have hired, there's been a lot of churn. Um, they don't usually last more than a couple of years. But, you know, you're looking for better quality guys in that, and you're hoping a director of football who would be monitoring them on a daily basis would know if things are going well or not. We also need that, you know, why is why is Celtic's uh, structure so opaque? Why is it completely opaque, right? Who do we know, apart from a couple of names that will drop now and again, who's the scouting team? You know, who's, who's in the football department? Who's responsible for all of this? Who worked under Mark Lowell? I mean, your, your man was at uh, Dudgeon or whatever his name was. It. I'd never even heard of him before he left. No. Do you know what I mean? His letter of resignation was the first thing I'd ever seen from him. You know, so, yeah, you know, you can imagine I was up to high Dudgeon and that. But, the, the, you know, it was... Who, why is it so opaque? Why, why can we not clearly see? I think it's simply because they're scared to make it obvious that they're trying to do things on the cheap. We don't have a, a proper uh, scouting network in place. This is all just agents phoning up saying, I've got this boy, I've got this boy. Uh, we're not really scouting. We're just, you know, shaking hands with agents. And there's a usual, I mean, the do do da hands of the world and all that who end up dominating because they've gotten in with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not the way things, there, are, there is so much wrong with, in that structure as it stands at the moment. That could be put right easily because we have the money to put it right. You're right, and it, and it becomes a numbers game. I think the lack of transparency in that respect, John, and I've got to agree with you there. Um, when Lowell left, you know, dodging it was the first time I'd heard the name mentioned. People might say, "Oh, you know, it's a matter of public record; you can find it out." Um, I, I don't think it's acceptable just to give people. Uh, jobs for two reasons a that they've got a specific surname or b just because they are well thought of at celtic as being a, an ex-player now if the ex-player um, or ex-employee is phenomenal at their job then great absolutely and i i know it wouldn't happen because he's he's now you know he's moved on but the ronnie dialers of this world is a star spotter he's a player developer jackie mcnamara um, is exactly the same and he'd done it you know, Partick Thistle, Dundee, and he continues to do it to this day. But these people are, are nowhere near Celtic, John. And there's a culture within the club, a culture of, for me, it's almost as if there's a, you know, there's an inner sanctum that you can't break into. And, and then when you get new ideas coming into that, i.e. Don Mackay, then you don't last long. Um, and, I, and I've seen it as a fan this season, um, without going into the specifics, but... Uh, there's a contentious na nature when the club look at where you are as a fan, your opinion, or if you've got a platform, John, and, and how dare you voice an opinion that isn't um, towing the party line, for example. What do you know about recruitment? What what do you know about running a football club? I'm a fan, and um, I've got opinions about it. Uh, but what I do know is that 
uh, Alexandro Bernabe wasn't worth £3.75 million and there's no way we scouted him properly if you think he was worth that kind of money. And then Lagerbielk, if, if he's not fast enough, who's to blame for that, John? You know, and these are the things, if, if you muddy the waters to a degree, then it's more difficult to question and identify who is responsible for it. The video footage of Barfield, I think it's phenomenal that we're investing in a site that we already own. And we're going to use that site to develop, hopefully, a new crop of talent. But unless you get the staff right and you get the people running that site properly, John, the bricks and mortar will not produce a footballer. It's no. the coaches, it's the people that's actually in charge of that system that will produce the footballers. Well, look, I've, I've been in, uh, <clears throat> in business for you know a long time and I've met a number of um, CEOs and those type of people, uh, entrepreneurs. And, uh, you know, I have always found certain ones of them, the, the top ones to be, like, you know, incredibly impressive, like devastatingly intelligent, um, unbelievably driven um, and relentless in pursuit of um, higher standards. And, uh, you know, you're either going with them or you're gone. Uh, and trying to maintain, trying to keep up with these guys, you know, is, is impossible for most people. Is Michael Nicholson that CEO? Right? So you're talking about, uh, Michael Nicholson is, without question, a tremendous lawyer. You know, he was a partner in Harper McLeod for 14 years. Uh, he is obviously a tremendous lawyer. Uh, does that make a tremendous CEO? Uh, my experience of CEOs is that they are either the good ones are either the guys who created the thing to start mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. or they are guys from a financial background uh, who to whom the money is easy, and then the rest of it's all about the culture, um, and you know trying to drive forward there, uh, and they are you know, constantly developing and you know uh, just a deeply deeply impressive people. So. Instead of that, we uh, got a guy in, punted him out the door for reasons nobody knows within a matter of a couple of months, and then appointed uh, the lawyer who had been sitting there the whole time. Uh, and now we're saying, you're the CEO. So where does that leave us, leave us from the top down? Because, you know, they, they, benchmarked, they benchmarked their salaries against similar-sized businesses all over Europe. Uh, if you had to look for a CEO who was, you know, for 770000 pounds basic, I think it is, plus bonuses, plus pension, plus share allocation, you know, whatever you're getting. If you're, if you're looking for a package like that, uh, you have to be quite something. You know, I mean, you really have to be incredibly impressive uh, to be getting those kind of uh, jobs. Is that what we got? So we... Instead of a global search after we get rid of Don Mackay, uh, we just looked in the office next door. Exactly. You know, Don yep. Mackay out, and then you looked in the office next door and said, Tell you what, Michael, you fancy this £2 million a year job? Say, oh, okay. So, you know, and then you wonder how Mark Lowell gets in, you know, and then you wonder why things aren't as we want them to be. Uh, and it's simply because we don't have the right people in the right positions. Uh, has been that way for you know a, a long time. I have no idea why Dermot Desmond treats this business so differently from every other business that he owns. You can be absolutely sure, certain as a matter of fact, that Michael Nicholson would not have been appointed CEO of any of his other businesses, right? So I, I, to me, it's, it's flabbergasting the, the level of cronyism that the, the level of laziness, a level of apathy, and that culture of just, you know, everything's all right, and don't worry about the peasants. Um, you know, they, they, they might revolt, but they can't do much because we've already got their money. Uh, so it's just, it drives me to distraction, to be honest with you. And come on, Paul John, I've told you I'm trying to, try to stay positive today. Am I dragging you into the, uh, the maelstrom of, of darkness here? Um, no, you, you're right, and Obviously, the, the pesky uh, platforms like Ascom, uh, Ascom Axom, <laughs> who who continually um, 
question these things. Uh, we, we are looked yeah. at with, with some degree of suspicion, John, and there should be no suspicion whatsoever. We're all absolute Celtic fans who uh, dedicate our life to the club um, on a daily basis and absolutely love Celtic and want the best for what the, the club stands for. And we do it, John, we do it on a shoestring budget. And, and one of these things that they've got to realise is that we're not doing it to try and, and do what we spoke about at the top of the show, clickbait and sensationalise bad negative stories towards Celtic. But when it, there's something pretty obviously wrong in terms of the culture, the recruitment, whatever it could be, because a lot of it stems from cultural issues um, within a workplace, then you're, you're going to point it out. And I'm not doing it from the outside looking in. We're, talk, we're talking through personal experience as well, John, of having to deal with certain individuals and, and having that contempt um, displayed right in front of your very eyes, which is very disappointing. And by the way, it doesn't it doesn't deter my love of Celtic Football Club. Um, nothing uh, could possibly do that. No individual could possibly do that. I'm really keen yeah. to get some of your thoughts coming in. Henrik McLaughlin, sorry about the bar cash reminder, right? <laughs> and for anybody else who wants to list poor goalies, I'm going to say it, and I've said it before, Muggleton is not in the same group of goalkeepers as Barkas and Ian Andrews and any of these other guys. Uh, JJI, after the break, we're in for an amazing running. See, there you go, positivity. Just think of the win, the meltdown across the city, the title party at Paradise, the other title party in a sun, sun-soaked Glasgow Cross. What a nice image to, to bring us to almost a close here, uh, John, and bring the positivity back in. We've got Rob Lilly also commenting on the YouTube. Great to see you, Rob. Will Prob still get our money back for Lager Lager? I don't think the move, um, I don't think has is, is probably, I don't think it's derailed his career, Rob. Um, I think that he will. He'll go back to Sweden probably um, and then rebuild it there. Um, if he was one for the future, I just think that manage that differently, John. Say, listen, Lagerbeck wasn't bought as a, as a starter. He's bought here. And see, in about 18 months, he might be a Celtic player. That buys you a bit of time with him, even if you don't rate him, even if you know he's not going to be in your team. But, yeah. you know, it's, to throw him on the scrap heap like that, I don't think was good management. Uh, oh, Jonathan, no, it's a shocking, shocking bit of management. Look at Maida's hair, John. Maida's hair's coming on. Look at that. Well, I'm so <laughs> glad about that because I, the, I, I was really annoyed when he went, he, he grew the sort of dark hair back because it was really difficult to pick out who was who then on the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to you're trying to rely on boots uh, and stuff like that. But he was, uh, you know, it, it's bad enough that Matt O'Reilly and Bernardo look so similar. Oh, they do. I'm uh, glad Bernardo wears gloves. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, just to but, identify them. You know, with 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 the, with the blonde hair, at least he's, he certainly stand out now. But that's a state. That's one of the, the those kind of statements. That's like a player that wears really really flashy boots. You've got to be able to back it up. You do. <laughs> he got a hat trick and he celebrated by getting the old peroxide in Maeda. Rio yeah. is levels above Bernardo. I don't disagree with that, Jonathan. His return will make huge uh, difference in speed over attack well, from midfield. So, yeah, yeah. What Rio? Come on now. I mean, let's, let's not be unrealistic about this. What Rio? Uh, you know, prime Rio levels above, for sure, mm -hmm. right? In terms of, certainly in terms of creativity, he's levels above, and that's what we need. We need people that can find the runs of the wee man, uh, you know, and, and just feed him all day. So, you know, but what Rio, uh, he, he hasn't played in how many months now is he hasn't, he hasn't played? Is, is Rio, are you seriously be saying he's going to come back uh, and not only discover prime Rio for him, but way, way better than he was at the start of the year when he was getting replaced by um, uh, David, what's his name, Turnbull? David, David Turnbull, uh, yeah. So, is he going to come back and be prime Rio? I mean, honestly, that would, you know, I'll, I'll go back to church and pray if that's a possibility, uh, you know, because I, I uh, that would be unbelievable. But I'm real, real sceptical that someone can come back from such a serious injury, having not been playing that well to start with, and suddenly rediscover his form of a year ago. I, I think we're maybe hoping for a bit too much, but he might make a difference. He might be all who makes a difference in a tight game. He comes on for 20 minutes even or whatever. He might be the man who makes a difference. He might be the man that slides that ball through. He might be the man that makes that worldy pass like he made against Madrid. You know, uh, so, I mean, I'm really, really hoping that that's the case because, you know, with Matt O'Reilly not firing, 
you would think that balance of the midfield we have just now is actually quite good. But with Matt O'Reilly not firing, we completely lack creativity and therefore there's more pressure on the wings. Yeah. Uh, and the wings until recently have not been playing well. So that's that you know, that all feeds into the same issues. So oh, if Rio could come back, Prime Rio, that would be. You know, and remember his debut as well against you know, Rangers stuff like that. If he, if he was to bury another one or two like that, that would be what a what a story that would be. That would be incredible. Uh, but you're so, right, yeah. John. You, you, listen, you're right to point it out, and I don't think it's been negative. You're right to point out but prior to the, the January transfer window, we're not going to have a magic wand in January because a lot of people build yourself up to that point. Right, it's okay. We'll sort it out in January, two or three new signings. But I think the point you made going into that window was, Right, but the same guys are, are behind us here. You know, what's going to change? Uh, and you were right. You were right. And and by the way, I'm delighted that he does made a contribution and Kuhn is starting to make a contribution. But, you know, there were other, other areas that we were looking to strengthen. And Rio's not been anywhere near prime Rio this season. At no point. And there's been flashes in a few games. But in terms of the way he was able to dominate and orchestrate a game, John, we've not seen that this season. To the point, like you say, that first choice um, in the first competitive game under Brendan Rodgers was David Turnbull, now warming the bench at Cardiff City. So you're, you're spot on. We know what he can bring. And if you, as you say, if he brings it two or three times in big, big moments between him coming back in the end of the season, it might just be enough because he is that type of player that could unlock um, a tight defence when nobody else is able to. Or he could be the difference against Rangers as he has been in the past. You, no, you're, you're spot on to, to point out, John. No doubt about it. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think what's, you know, again, what's even more important is that, you know, Callum comes back, mm -hmm. uh, all, all guns blazing, uh, because we, we definitely need that. You could argue, as I say, that the balance of that midfield with Bernardo just constantly running and, and um, you know, if the man would make a forward pass, he could be a great player. I just don't understand what's the matter with him. But anyway, you know, the endeavour he puts in off the ball, he covers the miles, he may, he drives forward, he gets himself in good positions, he give you know, he leaves him, you know, he, he's, a, he's a guy who makes himself available. Um, you know, he makes himself available, but if he can't shoot, then he's just going to pass it back. That's a problem. But you know, Matt O'Reilly is there, if he was as creative as before, and then a latter, I think a is playing pretty well. Uh, that, that should technically be a good balance. So, with, with Callum coming back in, then you know, I I, I would be hesitant to drop a lot. I, I think I think he gives us a real level of control there, um, and I would be hesitant to drop him out. And if anything, if Atati was coming back, you know, you know, I, I know he plays on a different side, really, but yeah, I would be thinking. Matt O'Reilly would be the one you're sacrificing there because he just hasn't been creative enough um, on the form. The, the yeah. thing is, John, we're sitting here on a, a Wednesday afternoon with 2,200 um, people watching live. It's an incredible turnout. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved wherever you watch us. We're going to start streaming on a couple of other platforms as well as we expand the uh, daily live stream. But before we go, I want to ask your, your thoughts and your views. We, we spoke quite a bit yesterday about the fact that uh, we've seen in the past, listen, we've been critical of Dermot Desmond, we've been critical of various people within the hierarchy at Celtic, but we have seen in the past that if he, if he gets a bee in his bonnet about something, then he can he can react, and he can react with a bit of gusto. Uh, people tell the famous story of us getting knocked out of the cup when Ronnie Dyler was in charge, and he thought, no, I'm going to take control here and bring in Brendan. And this was Brendan Mark 1, 13,000 fans up at Parkhead to say, Welcome to Celtic, Brendan. That that version of Brendan Rogers. Um, and it seems as though he's got a bee in his bonnet again, John. Um, and I'm liking it. And I think we should do this more often and go toe to toe with the authorities when necessary. Well, you know, I was reading uh, what Phil was saying, uh, and you know, Phil's a you know, he's not a blogger, he's a journalist, so he has a he's a journalist who blogs, so he does actually have sources, <clears throat> and it seems that that's his case. That in fact, behind the scenes, uh, Dermot has been looking at some numbers that have been crunched for him in terms of, uh, you know, the what was it Alan called it, the pattern of assistance, and he's unhappy with the outcome of that analysis. Uh, it's about time somebody was, um, and your man Crawford Allen. 
is is it a coincidence? Well, even if it, you know, apart from anything else, Crawford Allen should go because he brought in, implemented VAR, was responsible for the training on VAR, and it has been an unmitigated shambles for most of the season. Mm-hmm. And you know, there are again easy ways to fix that. <clears throat> and what we we're just saying about Celtic and why is the structure so opaque? You know, why is why is the communications between the the, the referee and the, the fourth officials and the, the VAR team? Why is that not? I mean, are they just swearing at each other? Is that just going to expose the fact that none of them have a clue and they just go, "Fuck, I don't know." What do you reckon? No. Even it up, even up, you know, guys. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> so, I mean, you get the feeling that would be close to being as amateur as that, because yeah. otherwise, why not? I mean, if you've watched any rugby this year, you'll know that you know Scotland have been on the, the, the bad end of some bad decisions and bad rules, uh, for instance, and simply because the decision made on the field remains the decision unless there is evidence, actual evidence, to overturn it. So you don't overturn it because you think it looks... If it's still debatable, like, you know, if you're still... If if the referee said uh, that's not a penalty and VAR said, go and look at it, and you come back and you could still be having a decision 10 minutes later about whether it was or wasn't a penalty, that is not sufficient. So the on-field decision should stand. Yeah. yeah. Again, you were saying that I don't know you were saying earlier on the week about re-refereeing and stuff like that, and that's exactly it. So unless there is uh, actual evidence, black and white evidence, um, then it shouldn't be overturned unless the referee goes away and looks at it and says, Oh no, I definitely got that wrong. Right, if it's definitive. But it shouldn't be a discussion. You know, it shouldn't be, oh, I don't know what you reckon was, I don't know all the rest of it. You know, if, if neither of them are absolutely clear about it. If there's, you know, if the VAR and the ref, you know, are, are still havering about it after a couple of minutes, then it's the on-field decision has to stand. Yep. You know, right, and it should be as simple as that. And again, with what, why can we not have this? It's, you know, it's very. They've had it in rugby for years now. Why can we not just listen to what they're saying? We clear up issues of transparency. We clear up issues of competence. We clear up issues of bias. We clear up all of that. And mm-hmm. what are you saying? You absolutely can't do it. Tell me why you can't do it. Are you saying we don't have enough money? Well, admittedly, it would have been nice not to get the pound shop version of our with a with the lines drawn from thirty yards behind at a right angle. Um, you know, so you know that may be a factor. But at the end of the day, it shouldn't have been implemented unless it was going to be done properly. And I, Colin was saying right, right at the start, this is a pound shop version of our. It's going to be a shambles. Um, so. You know, and that's pretty much what it's been. So these these see these issues very much like a lot of issues in Celtic seem to be very obvious to the likes of me and you who are just punters. This can be dealt with by doing that. Why are you not doing that? If you're not doing that, there must be a reason for it. What is that reason? And I think Dermot Desmond uh, might have it about him to go and try and find out what that reason is. Chilled up. Fantastic. <laughs> I look forward to uh, to seeing how that one goes. John, there's been a few people in the comments saying, where do you get one of the bumblebee mugs? Well, <laughs> as I was saying before, uh, obviously doing a, a, a platform and setting up a platform like a Celtic State of Mind is, is very much on a shoestring when you compare it to the likes of Celtic Football Club who have a massive big budget. So we do have some merchandise which is normally available at our live events, uh, which we do once or a couple of times a month. If you want to buy them online, there is a new shop and it's a, a much better all sing and all dancing version of the Axom shop. And I've just dropped a link underneath the video. So if you go down there, there's a there's a wee link for wee Jamie Tierney. Uh, we're always raising cash and awareness for Jamie. And there is a, a shop link down there if you want to have a look. Um, if you have any suggestions for designs, keep them clean. Let us know in the comments section. Thank you all for getting involved. Um, as I was saying during the week as well, John, we've got a, a German documentary team who want to come and see Axom's live event with Paddy McCourt and get in amongst the Celtic fans and interview years and all that kind of stuff. In the week leading up to a big Glasgow derby, they have covered quite a few derbies and they're really excited to, to come and soak up the atmosphere in the, le- the week leading up to our big game in April. If you want to come along, as quite a few of you did yesterday, click on the link. There's a few tickets available. Come along 
and be part of what could be a very memorable evening. Um, you could be forever captured uh, on a German documentary film um, that you can show your wains and your grandbairns and all that kind of stuff <laughs> in years to come. John, I'm going to have to get on the treadmill for that one. Thank you all for pointing that out. Thank you all for joining in. Uh, once again, thank you to John Hughes for joining me on a Celtic State of Things. Yeah, yeah.